uh, IPVM, the long tabled execution layer, or maybe the easiest way to run Wasm everywhere, or maybe the fastest way to ship IPFS features to users, or a step towards an interplanetary OS. Kind of take your pick. Uh, I'm going to cover a bunch of stuff. Hopefully we'll have time. Uh, actually, I, I really want to have time uh, at the end for questions, discussions. Um, I, I think it could get spicy, it should be great. Um, this is super early days. This isn't like really deeply uh, uh, built, designed, et cetera. It's mainly in the like requirements gathering. Can we all align on what this thing needs to be, right? I'm also pulling a bunch of stuff out of the fission roadmap and putting it in here because if we can outsource that into the larger community and participate in that, that's obviously better for us. But also, we've thought about what we need for a while, and there's probably other people that need the same sorts of things. So, at a high level, what is this? It's a blessed VM, probably Wasm, because Wasm seems to be winning, in every IPFS node. Um, this gets you things like transparent IPFS node grade upgrades, like in the web, right? Where you just load your software, it gets upgraded for you, you don't have to do anything. And that's controversial, just to get started, right? But if we're gonna talk about moving really fast, sometimes doing things like this is an advantage, right? The web is by far the best distribution method uh, system that we've ever built, right, as a society. Um, it can support features like AutoCodec, which is the next talk, so stick around for that one. Um, you can compute without required consensus. You can still do consensus, but without required consensus, so you don't have to go out to, say, the FVM. You can run things yourself. You can do global adaptive optimization, which we'll talk about at the end, and uh, this old idea of mobile computing, which doesn't mean on your phone. It means moving compute around, suspending it, moving it, having it run somewhere else. This gets us a bunch of, bunch of things, right? Um, with content addressing, data's become ubiquitous. That's awesome. I want compute to be that awesome. Uh, having both end users and IPFS node developers know that there is a Wasm execution around means that they can rely on it. And they can say, I'm gonna ship this thing, and it's always gonna be on the other end. You can get deep integration with tooling, so both the Wasm tooling and then increasingly the IPFS tooling, and we can share all of our work with each other. Right? We can get full consistency between clients, deduplicate the amount of work, and, and this is the one that I'm really excited about, is we can create the HTTP of compute. So no more proprietary lambdas. You push these jobs out, people pick them up, there may or may not be a payment layer, in the same way that IPFS may or may not have a payment layer on it. So what, what do we actually need this thing to do? <clears throat> it definitely needs to be portable, it needs to be deterministic, probably needs to be verifiable by default, right? Turn that on and off. Does this, sort of open questions, does this need to be completely pure? Does it do managed effects? Kind of an open question, right? Like uh, if I'm running a completely untrusted code, then I probably have it really locked down. If I'm running something from within my team or inside my organization, maybe I can give it a little bit more power. The nice thing is Wasm, and, and WASI in particular, have really nice interfaces for doing these kinds of things. And maybe that ends up exposed in a manifest based on these are the, you know, the um, resources we're gonna plug in. Um, effects are always uh, scary because if you rerun them, uh, then depending on the kind of effect you have, some effects are fully uh, safe to run again, right? It's like I'm gonna read something out of, you know, I'm gonna do a network call and pull something in by content address. If I do that again, it doesn't matter, it's fine, right? If I'm sending an email, it's more of a problem. Uh, in, enforced termination, we definitely need these things to stop at some point. Now, interesting about uh, totality is your program might terminate at the end of the heat death of the universe, so we probably want to have some way of stopping it before then for things that shouldn't run forever. And the really important one is, uh, as an efficiency thing, moving both, yes, grabbing data locally, running it locally, which is often really nice for, you know, if you have some encrypted content, something like that, but also moving your compute to data. 
And because code is data, we can package up a WASM module or you know, moving compute to data, data to compute, um, because often you want to move, just you know, take your WASM module and actually push it across and have it run over there. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment. But even as we're discovering, you're running these things uh, at, uh, as operators, right? Um, for data, you want to have push and pull. And sometimes you want to be able to push and pull things to that machine specifically, right? So both push and pull are important in this case, especially if you're doing matchmaking for, and they're going to run the compute for me, right? Then you want to really only have it go there. Um, and then you need some kind of uh, a permissions model. So I'm, I'm not biased at all. You could use a, a UCAN uh, for remote invocation, uh, for, for example. Adoption, um, so you know, arguably a major reason to use WASM is that uh, it's gaining a huge amount of adoption, tooling, all of these things. It appears to be the future. But it also, it's getting adoption because you can bring your own language. And in this case, so we should learn from that, right? We should definitely support all of the you know, various languages because you know, it's, it's WASM, but also support common patterns, right? Like build packs or cron jobs or manifests and learn lessons from those and make this familiar and easy to adopt. Right? We could have the coolest system in the world if nobody's using it because you have to learn, you'll read a, a, a book beforehand. It doesn't matter, right? It has to be super, super easy to get up and running with and use and be useful. It has to be substantially better than what people have today, right? Um, and having, I think, having a, a WASM execution that you can literally just say like, yeah, run this function over that thing is already amazing. But then this should be able to plug into systemd, cron jobs, all of that stuff, right? As, uh, as I pull stuff down, maybe I want to process on it. Maybe I want to build indices, all of this stuff, right? And so uh, how we actually write that up is, uh, in a familiar way, is important. Uh, deep integration with the system, right? We want to lean into content addressing, right? It's not just an S3 bucket. It's special does things in a particularly uh, good way, right? It, it deduplicates, you can grab it from a bunch of peers, uh, you can write things back, all of this stuff, right? It needs to be more than the sum of its parts, more than just uh, compute, more than just data. There needs to be some deep integration between these. You need to have remote and local execution. So I should always be able to run everything myself locally or push it somewhere else. And, uh, we should reuse this community's experience with WASM uh, in things like the FVM, Aquamarine, Cloudflare Workers, Backlow, Web3 Storage, IPFS Fan, all of this stuff. We've done a bunch of exploration with this stuff already. Let's just, let's just start grabbing some of this stuff and seeing what the common patterns are and see what they, they, uh, um, how they use this. There's always trade-offs. Uh, so this is uh, Juan's triangle. Um, and uh, you, this is you know a uh, uh, pick two of three. You have performance, uh, verifiability, or privacy, but not all three. Right? So your uh, centralized cloud providers, your uh, you know EC2 and lambdas are in the bottom right corner. And as you go towards verifiability, things get slower because they have to get slower. You're doing more work, right? And as you go up to privacy, you're also losing performance because you're doing more work. Um, having both of them uh, is an, you know, one of these other cases where it's like, well, you know, now you're really doing a lot of work. And maybe we'll get there eventually, but you know, probably not today. We don't want to turn any of these options off. And that's another nice thing with a reasonably low-level VM like Wasm, right? is as things get more supported and as the algorithms get faster, you can totally do snarks or whatever, but it's not required by the entire system, right? You can plug those in as modules. And an ask I have for the end of the presentation, uh, like, don't get me wrong, I'm still going, but for the end of the presentation, we should talk about anti-goals. So think about those as, as we go. So uh, execution as IPLD, or interplanetary linked invocation, or whatever cute name you want to put on it. Um, this is a description of the job and the results. So not just, I want to run this thing, this module with these arguments, but I also want to collect what came out of it. Okay. 
Uh, we need an index or names, something human readable possibly, for later lookup. What was the result of when I asked for this job to be done? Right? And uh, streams of results per machine. I have an entire slide for that later. So very roughly, this looks something like this. So here's IPLD. We have the root node, has arguments, um, which is usually just a, um, a byte array, but sometimes you know, maybe we want to break this up into actual readable argu arguments and, and an ABI. Uh, we have the WASM blob, and then some configuration, you know, scheduling, config, something else in there. When this finishes, or when this goes into the queue, <coughs> we have this output, and then results, at minimum results, and possibly more data, stats, how long it took to execute, um, if there's anything else that needs to get run after this, was this suspended, anything like that, right? All this extra information. And we want to connect them together in a tree like this um, for, for a bunch of reasons. So one is if I'm doing optimistic verification, I'm going to have two different SIDs at the top of this thing, right? Um, and then I, now I know, okay, I need to actually go and check these. Uh, schedulers, events, job streams in general. <coughs> this is one way to do it. That happens to work nicely uh, when you want to move things around or run them locally. There's other models, but just as a, as a general version. You have a base event stream that says, I'm pushing you jobs. And then uh, streams that handle pure functions and pure effects. Now, pure effect is something like, go into IPNS, read me the latest version of this thing, compute over that, right? Uh, so it's always getting baked down into something that's actually pure. So that's time. Um, obviously, pure functions very easy. Um, pure effects have this uh, problem where, okay, I've computed, I've got it back down, and I'm gonna you know, hop forward, but ah, actually, I didn't, my IPNS was out of date, I need to run this thing again and I don't want that mapped to the name that I give the job, so I need to roll back over it. Because it's pure, we can do that. That's actually completely fine. Uh, the other thing, and this is a, a little bit further out there, but if we're gonna lean into content addressing, uh, if we can get deduplication from, uh, on data and breaking data up, we can do the exact same thing with compute and intermediate results. So uh, when you have scale, right, this is, in, in an ideal world, as you add more machines in parallel, right, you get more scale, and it's linear. But that, unfortunately, isn't how this works for basically any job, because uh, you have uh, diminishing returns. Uh, and beyond this, you have the universal scaling law, which says that if you need any coordination between these, you, you're waiting for something coming off of another queue, you're waiting for the next step, you uh, did uh, optim ex optimistic execution, and oh, that was actually the wrong argument, you've gotta go back, right? All of these things, you actually lose um, performance as you, after a certain point with your parallelization. So you actually need to keep in this smaller range. If you're keeping all of your outputs and you're in a pure environment, you can do uh, adaptive optimization, essentially hotspot JIT, the entire VM globally across the entire planet, right? Now, how useful this ends up being in practice, it's kind of an open question, right? How many functions can we grab the intermediate output of and feed that into other systems, right? And this has been tried in various languages, like uh, uh, Haskell famously does some of this, like not, not to a huge degree, but some of this um, to, to get performance, right? Um, but, It'd be really interesting to see this at full scale because some things, you know, there'll be a power law, some things will get reused all the time and then we can just cache them locally and never run that compute again, ever, right? Um, the other thing you can do is if you notice something's really, uh, like, <laughs> literally hotspot optimization, some WASM blob is really popular, you can, t you can just optimize that blob specifically and, and JIT it. So this is the, the caching of the intermediate results. Essentially, we, as we're, you can do this in various levels of granularity, like we, we could write our own WASM execution that does every you know, opcode, or between modules, you tap the result and you push that into IPFS and you say this is an uh, intermediate result. And the nice thing there is if you have some other execution, you can skip one step, feed that into the pipeline, 
uh, and keep going, right? This is essentially kind of like a suspend resume mechanism uh, to some degree, which Lurk is playing around with. Uh, so for those not familiar, it's a snark, a Turing complete snark system where it externalizes its state, like its, its internal running state, does the proof, and then feeds that into the next step. So essentially suspends, proves, and continues. Uh, so that's not to say that this is using snarks, doesn't have to, but uh, borrowing this uh, state externalization idea basically between the, the module calls, just as a, a natural place to break things up. This all has a nice feedback loop, right? You fetch data, you compute on that data, you output more, da output more data, and then go to two, uh, which means um, that we end up generating a whole lot of data, and we need places to store that data, like Filecoin. The last one, uh, because I was chatting with some people in the Compute Over Data group yesterday, the last one that's always controversial uh, is managed effects, um, which uh, I don't think a lot of people have actually run into in a distributed systems context uh, before. Uh, it's, it's actually finding its way into, into a few places. But essentially, you do what, as much of the pure computation as you can, and then you output a description of what you want to have done. You say, send email to this, you know, here's the body, here's the address. And then that goes to somebody who's going to execute it. They do the effect, which is completely off system, right? Like, hopefully this actually got run. We have no way of checking that, you know, in the general case. And then that comes back down, and we write into the stream, this is the result. This is what happened. And then if somebody is looking at this, uh, you know, these uh, trees later of the execution of what happened, they go, okay, this is what we run. And then, oh, it actually performed the effect, and this was the result. I don't have to run this again. Right? I sent the tweet, this is the, the number I got back from the Twitter API, done, right? Don't, don't rerun. Uh, IPVM for IPFS internals, so we could ship IPFS in IPFS. So content addressing IPFS itself, shipping around WASM modules that do ipfs -y things that we can integrate deeply into, uh, into these nodes, and Possibly not for everything, right? If you have something that's really heavily performance critical, then maybe you don't do this part, right? Um, but for uh, shipping updates, shipping bug fixes, having new codecs, in fact, again, we'll talk about autocodec in the next session, new kinds of cryptography, bug fixes, uh, and especially sharing effort between projects so that we're not rewriting the same code n times would be really nice. And that's not to say that uh, you know, there's anything wrong in having a Go and a Rust implementation of something. And for critical portions of your code, that totally makes sense. But if you're trying to build a new uh, implementation from scratch, or you're trying to implement a new feature, this might be, at minimum, a nice place to start so that you can ship the feature today and then optimize it later. And if you have a Wasm VM guaranteed for the user execution, that means that you definitely have it around uh, to put in the middle. Uh, security, when you're pushing around uh, things that can actually run, this is a bigger security uh, question than, uh, than data, right? Data at least is static. Maybe you're going to get the wrong data, but uh, it's not like you're going to spend a bunch of CPU cycles or you know, something, right? Um, or, or even trust that the computer is being done correctly, right? It's like, you know, I, I want you to apply an, a, a photo filter to this image and it just replaces the image, right? Like, you, you don't want things like that, so you need to have either a verifiability uh, or some kind of a, a trust model. Right? And so there's, uh, a, in general, uh, when you're doing things in a uh, distributed system where you don't want centralization, then uh, capabilities-based systems uh, are essentially where it's at. So, yep, there, there's UCAN, um, and that's great if you have something that's offline, uh, it does uh, Spooky, SPKI, um, which is a subset of OCAP. Now, downside for OCAP is you have to be online in the general case for it. So there's a spectrum here of how online or, and offline, how much am I interactively doing some things with somebody else, um, and uh, you know, uh, how much am I willing to verify as I go along. Maybe I don't want to do any of this because this is running on the, you know, the company intranet and we don't care, or I'm working with completely untrusted peers, 
and I, I want to go to full, uh, full OCAP. I'm going to put things in, you know, all, all of these, these concepts that we'll have to get familiar with from, from, the, from that whole world. So if you go to eRice.org, there's tons of writing on this, right? It's like, you know, vats and objects and all of this stuff, right? Um, and uh, yeah, so there, there's that. Also, mobile computing. So I have uh, some compute running on my phone, and I say, ah, oh, this is taking too long. I'm going to suspend it and move that process over to my computer or to a cloud service provider and start running it there. But now it's in a different context, and maybe it has a bunch of my decrypted data, right? Or maybe uh, you know, I really trust that I'm going to get the result back locally, and now it's running somewhere completely else, and it, there wasn't an API call in the middle. I just suspended it and moved it, right? So we need systems like this to say, yes, you're actually allowed to grab this, uh, this, this wasm blob, this chunk of data to run, and uh, I actually trust you to do this. There's some level of trust up front. The more capabilities you have, the more problems you have. If you plug this thing into your file system, it can write arbitrarily. Often that's a great thing, right? Like, yes, I, I would absolutely love to have this, you know, all fuse enabled and just, you know, running through the entire system, um, but not on completely untrusted code. So we need to have some switches to say, yes, enable powerful features for this. Don't enable powerful features for that. I trust these peers. I'll get a UCAN from this one. I need live verification for them to run stuff, right? And there's this whole spectrum uh, in between. As a first step, we would want to pick one, which is probably the trusted, untrusted switch, and then add these things in later. Um, having remote capabilities into other people's systems is super powerful, right? So again, we're doing a lot of this stuff with UCAN today, where it's openly interoperable, right? I create some data uh, myself. I create a UCAN for it, and I send it to Philip, and Philip wants to apply that photo filter, and he sends it up into the cloud. We should be able to follow this chain around and just have things execute. Um, and when that gets back to, you know, let's say that it's in more of this live model and it gets back to me, hey, am I allowed to do this thing? Can you send me the link to the next chunk of data? I can just look at the certificate chain and go, yeah, that's the thing you want. Here you go, right? So we want this to be open and interoperable as much as possible without always having to go back and ask, hey, could you update the list and put me on it, right? The, the more that we can keep things open, the faster we can get going. Speaking of moving fast, uh, state channels. Um, so uh, it's prob probably, I, I, I don't know, but I assume that the, the Polycon folks have, have looked into this a whole, a whole bunch. Uh, state channels uh, as opposed to doing things in consensus. And maybe actually this is possibly a moot point because I was talking to Juan yesterday the day before about hierarchical consensus and it's like, ah, oh, it's actually like region-based and now I don't have you know, these like massive you know, latency concerns and maybe kind of, you know, instant finality and, and all of that stuff. Um, but this is another way to get instant finality in a peer-to-peer, -peer, like point-to-point -point system where I don't need global states, right? You pay for consensus. Consensus always takes time, uh, both in latency and in uh, agreement, because it has to execute in synchronous rounds, right? This doesn't. This is totally async, um, like to the point that one party in the channel can be offline, uh, come online, sign the thing, push it back up, and it's done instantly. Right? So this is... The basic idea, for those who haven't been exposed to this before, is that you have two parties. They want to do some interaction. They uh, um, put some state, say, on chain or in a public place. And that is the agreed upon initial state. And then they start computing and signing uh, essentially an updated log and, and countersigning it with each other. And they can do that as soon as the other one's signed. It's done. Now, if they don't have a direct connection, you know, they're somewhere else in this graph, well, then you can follow this system through there and say, you know, this is often done financially. You know, if, uh, you know, person in the top left has some, uh, you know, $100 and wants to get it to person in the, you know, middle right, um, they go through all these intermediaries and the balances update along the way. And so it's almost like pushing in, in one direction or the other. And you can generalize that to any kind of state. So to say, here's my you know, seed leach rate, all of this stuff, right? Or here's the amount that I trust this other peer or not, and to propagate information in the system that way. Um, you can also use, in fact, we've experimented a little bit with, yet again, you can uh, for all of this stuff too, um, because it's about this countersigning, and so is that. 
Payments, payments will come up uh, for sure at, at some stage because you're, you're running compute. Um, so uh, reusing the same state channel idea for payment, reputation, et, et cetera, means that uh, you can plug in a payment system to that as well. And so I, I still think like, you know, base IPFS, there's no payment by default, anybody can participate. But if you wanna go up to having a pinning service or a provider of some kind, you might have to pay. It would be really nice to have um, direct, you know, here's my uh, it, you know, uh, existing relationship with Web3 storage and they're gonna pro provide me a terabyte of data uh, as, as a quota and I'm going to uh, not have to go through the whole dance every time, just say like, yep, here, you know, use up a bunch of my, my quota as I'm going, right? And make that really fast. So where to start? This is a very rough list, um, but roughly in order. Ship a WASM execution engine of some kind into an IPFS implementation. Do manual invocation from the CLI. Don't do anything automated at first. Experiment with an IPLI format um, and outputs and manifests and all of that stuff. Work up to a concurrent job scheduler, uh, including tunable trust and resource limits. Figure out sensible default configs from this experience. Uh, so like at, up until this point, we're just running stuff right out of the box. There's probably gonna need to be a lot more adjustment. Um, and so uh, iteratively improve that. Um, experiment with deeper integration. Use Wasm IPLD, other, other packages, and see if we can get this deeper into the nodes. Plug it into cron, have event triggers, um, have it be a little bit smarter about, okay, if I get, if I make a request about this IPLD thing, uh, sorry, IPNS thing, I want that to get transformed in this way and written over here. Uh, and then finally, in this first chunk of work, figure out how to push jobs and associate uh, the authorization with it as well. So with about five minutes left, um, open discussion, uh, which I expect to get a little bit spicy. Um, tell me why you uh, lo love or hate these ideas. Uh, and it doesn't just have to be with me. Like let's, ha I also wanna know what people's requirements are, right? And I also wanna hear why this is a terrible idea. Yeah, really cool. Um, it's a, a question, I, th I think a little bit with the, with the VMs is when you try and bind them to the, to the host, the thing that lives outside, you're, you're, you, you build some interface and you're like, you know, here's, here's, how I'm, here's how I'm doing the binding. And then you realize you got it wrong. And I guess the question is how we might want to deal with that. Right. Uh, sorry, you got the, like the config for the, sorry, did we the, sorry, did the user get it wrong or did we get it wrong at like a spec level? Spec level, we got spec it wrong. Level. We wanna make a spec PR, cause nope, turns out like uh, we, we allocated large slice and we needed to do incremental things and we didn't realize. Oh yeah, all this stuff should be versioned. The entire That's system it. should be versioned. It. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not so worried about security. I'm more worried about like, in this case, I'm thinking like performance. Like, do I have to keep translating all of the old versions into the new versions? And so I'm like, I have, I have you know, uh, IPVM v, v1 code that I'm now running on IP, IPVM v5. And now I have to like seven through four translation layers before I get anything useful out. And that, and then every time someone wants to make a new change, the the old people are like, no, but my code will be slower. Um, yeah. Or we could run it in the old VM. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So I have some questions that are possibly so basic you can make fun of them. But as somebody who is only looking at Wasm from the outside and wondering what can we do in the broadest sense, I'm also wondering about interfaces and what kind of design languages we even have for those. So an impression that I'm gathering is, sorry, comment first, question at the end. <laughs> um, there is some set of parameters that go into a WASM function call and some results. In practice, it seems like people are also always talking about some sort of syscall-like interface. 
in case you need to have the WASM thing ask for more data from the host and receive it later. And then we also keep seem to see um, the interface have a bytes blob fly through somewhere. And that bytes blob is opaque at that first level of an interface, but then usually it's implicitly structured in some additional way. Like if it's an IPLD content blob, then mm -hmm. maybe we can ignore that structure. Or maybe that's implicitly part of the contract. How much design language do we have for this stuff? <laughs> Yeah, so I, mean, so I guess there's like a few layers of question in there. Uh, so one is, what should the interface even look like? I think that's where we go and look around and see what is everybody else doing, what's Docker doing, what's, uh, what do build packs look like, what's been successful, what do people really love, all of the stuff, right? Um, in terms of syscalls, uh, so fundamentally WASM understands, ah, I might have a stream, like li literally a byte stream, import, right? And it knows nothing about the source of that, right? And maybe the programmer labels that source of randomness, and then you're gonna read off of the stream and then use that to do cryptography, right? Or you're gonna do networking, and the host is gonna provide you networking, it's gonna plug in, um, uh, you know, whatever, a TCP stream, and you can do read and write over this binary channel. And that's all it knows about, just binary channels. And so anytime that you need these extra capabilities, you have to provide those from the host. And so one of the open questions is, what should the host provide, right? And should you be able to turn those on and off? Let's say that I expect there to be networking, but I'm running this on a unnetworked device. It just fails. So do we need to write it into the description, hey, this is only gonna run if you have these capabilities turned on? Probably, right? Um, and then the last one I think was, uh, how do we actually feed the data into the system? Um, if we have structured data, how do we specify that? But I guess, um, so like just to sanity check something I saw on the screen, I think it might have been in the last talk, but I know you folks work together, so forgive me if I ask you. Like I saw Rust code that was exporting a C ABI, mm -hmm. and that was the WASM ABI also, but it was also designed for JS, right? So, yes. goodness gracious, <laughs> So, which of these things is load-bearing? Yeah. How, like, is this our best de facto language for WASM, or is this, like, wildly evolving and this is our stab at it? Like, what's what's up? Yeah, so it's, it's the, the way we do this is completely unspecified, and we should get a bunch of people in a room to, to figure that out. Maybe this should be in the COD working group, all those things, right? Um, WASM itself doesn't care what language you wrote it in. It has low level, lowish level instructions for, uh, for working with data. So there's, um, yeah, you'll, you'll need some interfaces. If you're grabbing JSON, you probably wanna put a uh, codec in between to say, okay, now dump this into the way that we do arguments for this, or my program is gonna have to do that translation directly. Because they're modules, you should be able to go and grab the whatever DAG JSON uh, codec, WASM blob, and put that in front, right? And basically say, as you pass through, dump this into raw IPLD data model, and then my code will know how to handle that, for example, right? Or use an ADL, something like that. Um, in terms of the actual, from the outside doing the calls, we'll need a calling convention of some kind, right? Um, and that will also need to export like ABI and various things in that manifest as well. Thanks for indulging me on the basics. basics. Yeah, I'm gonna go even more basic, uh, but it, it's interesting because I know I'm like, sit, it's ironic that I'm sitting literally in between you two because I know what both of you are doing and it's gonna kind of touch on both. Like, I think there's even something both higher, more higher level and also more basic, which is not just how do you write the one wasm, you talked about like wiring together many wasms to accomplish something. Mm -hmm. We've talked about this many times and there's, there's also a DAG definition that you're gonna need to establish, mm -hmm. which some like, you know, whatever, recursively defines the thing that we're trying to accomplish mm -hmm. and sticks whatever, codecs in between or whatever you might uh, say. I, I think that that's just a yes and, that's nothing other than that. Okay, I love you guys so much. All right, so um, a lot of this like uh, definition of um, 
WebAssembly that connects to what other WebAssembly to provide abstractions to potentially um, existing or non-existing lower levels uh, of the API is pretty much exactly what uh, WASI is, right? So mm -hmm. um, if we want, like they have uh, a spec language that can generate ABI. So uh, if we really want to be like serious about this, we can take their language and write an interface for it. Um, and then it'll do code gen and we can do magic stuff with them and then maybe have a standardize, which would also be very cool. Um, it also goes into the component model of things where um, they recently moved to, where you have WebAssembly that connects to other WebAssembly, and then you combine WebAssembly, and then you have one giant WebAssembly that can do different things, and you can compose things. But for our cases, we have a linking thing. So we can have a DAG description of different WebAssembly modules that you, you just point to the DAG, and it says, I use these, and it's dependencies and quotations, I guess. So it's binary dependencies, weird. Um, and then, yeah, just compiles it all together and it's a single WebAssembly thing. And it, you can just add, for like um, breaking previous things, um, if you're smart about it, you can just add a polyfill um, of a WebAssembly that just polyfills to the old interface. But yeah, that's a bit more work. Thanks. Yeah. Hi there. Well, it, there's so much like intersection in your talk and uh, in what we do and at Fluence and Aquamarine that mm -hmm. I, I'm kind of not sure where to start. That's awesome to see the same ideas uh, being discussed. So answering the, the, the thing about breaking old stuff, uh, if you have like WebAssembly, if you have algorithms expressed in WebAssembly and you abstract over them with some like expression language, it even gives you a way to have like IPFS node that can support at the same time several bit swap implementations, like and they all work. So have you ever thought about like abstracting LPTP protocols to WebAssembly so they can kind of be pluggable implementations of them? That's what we like plan to do pretty soon. So it would be nice to, to, to discuss and talk over. And also once you have like a, a lot of wasms and link them through like a component model or through linking into some kind of like functioning parts of a node of a bigger system, you start to have a need uh, to express algorithms up over them, like distributed one ones. Have you thought about how to do that? About language uh, maybe or something, some way to express distributedness over a lot of like functioning parts in WASM? Yeah, uh, so I mean, a bunch of stuff in there. Um, so uh, the, I go back through them. So uh, one thing is, uh, yeah, uh, I love stuff you guys do. It's great. Um, thank you. Um, also, the uh, Filecoin FVM community also has some experience with this, right? Like, we, we have a, a bunch of projects that are doing, doing things like this. Um, I would love to get everyone in a room, maybe at the COD working group, uh, and to talk about like what, what are the right ways to do these things, how much do we need to express some of these things as functions versus declarative specifications as a DSL, right? One thing that, uh, so part of the managed effect idea is you should be able to create from, from WASM as opposed to a dedicated language, right? Like th this is a, um, like just use the one tool strategy, right, and just write it in, in whatever. Um, output, one of your outputs, is a declarative specification of how this thing should get run. And you tag that as an effect for how the thing should get continued, right? Um, or suspended, or however it wants to happen. Um, that, that's one approach. Um, you know, there's, uh, there, there's obviously a bunch of others, right? Um, so yeah, I, I think mainly we just need to get uh, a bunch of people in the room and, and, and hash this stuff out. The other thing I wanted to mention from, I can't remember somebody else's comment earlier, is if we as a community um, decide that we're really serious about WASM, we should join the Bytecode Alliance and get involved in all of that. Though that obviously probably means like a full-time spec person or something, but yeah. So you plan to, to like wrap network interactions as a managed effects stuff? Mm -hmm. you, that's how you foresee it? Uh, I mean, that that's one approach, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, that being said, I, you know, I, I come from 
uh, very much, you know, a, a functional programming background. So, you know, I, I, I have a hammer and everything looks like a managed effect nail, so. <laughs> yeah. uh, may I ask you also a question <coughs> about uh, component models that already ha have been mentioned? So, uh, as I understand, you have your own interfaces, your own ABI. Uh, have you considered uh, WebAssembly interface types for and the WIT language, uh, especially? So, for example, you know, like there is a, it was uh, uh, developed inside uh, as an extension for WASI in last time uh, group, and then they want to standardize it as a WebAssembly proposal itself, not as a WASI, but as a WebAssembly. And now there are like a lot of extension uh, with WIT, especially in last time. Mm -hmm. So have you considered this? Yeah, uh, so I, I think we should borrow whatever is coming out of the community. I, I didn't realize it was that far along. They, they, like this is running today? Yes. Amazing, yeah, we should totally use that. Um, there's some extra stuff that we can do on top of that by taking advantage of content addressing in addition, but like, yeah, like let's not rewrite anything. Right? Like, let's just use as much that already exists as possible. Let's take stuff, so let's just straight up steal stuff from the WebAssembly world, just wholesale, and then let's start stealing things from other projects in this ecosystem, right? Like Fluence, like FVM, like all these other projects. Um, and if they have, uh, uh, what, you know, if, if WIT is essentially done, yeah, let's plug it in, amazing. Yeah, thank you. But so yes, uh, it is done, but uh, there is no good uh, developer experience from, for example, from Rust side. But no... but but actually, I mean, I mean, like uh, it's uh, now it's difficult to compile like uh, Rust file, Rust code to WebAssembly with support of Bit. So there are no so like uh, I know good developer experience. Hmm. But so... but but inside like what sometimes it's already implemented. Right. So, are are you saying that it it you have to write your code in a uh, adaptive op, adaptive optimizable way? Special? It uh, can't just yep. it can't run static analysis. Yep. And, yep. And you you, you need you need to have like compiled WebAssembly file and uh, like an error .read file that uh, uh, like uh, describes its interfaces. So I mean that this file like uh, doesn't generate it uh, by itself during the compilation. Okay. Uh, let, let's take this offline. I'd, I'd love to know more detail because, um, yeah, the way I was thinking about it was essentially closer to like a hotspot shit where it just it looks at the thing and starts applying iteratively optimizations over it and then having a pointer into it basically saying like, I'm optimizing this thing. If you want to run it faster, run this one. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, can you talk a bit about how you are thinking about um, distributed execution across many VMs. So you, you have, um, of course, as you bring up many VMs, you can connect them because of all the pure functions, the, the hash linking and so on. There's like a nice translation layer. Um, I'm gonna be talking about some of that later on. Um, curious just how you're thinking about it, um, how you see the current, like those streams that you're describing, mm -hmm. coupling, like what happens when you have many of them? Do you envision many of them per single local VM? Um, and, and maybe like practically like the boundaries of execution, like what when you run some software, do you run an instance that's gonna run and manage one of these and have a run loop, or do you envision like many run loops, uh, or is that like, you know, I don't mm -hmm. know. Yeah, uh, so the, yeah, the, there's a few things in here. Uh, so one that uh, uh, I, I would love to see them, oh, maybe, maybe, maybe the Fluence folks have this, uh, is um, deterministic parallelism. Uh, pretty much a requirement for, for a bunch of these things, right? Like, we want to run it twice, it has to be deterministic, and there's some trade-offs in there, right? Um, in terms of the actual scheduling uh, and the, um, the pipelines, I think it depends on the kind of job that you're running, right? So if you want this run by, you know, n, n number of peers minimum, then uh, you push it into a single queue, and you say, this is a work uh, stealing queue, go for it, and if there's duplication, that's fine. If it's, I want this run once and exactly once by one person, right, or this chunk of it, run once, exactly once by one person, uh, then you need consensus. It's, it's distributed, right? Uh, or, uh, sorry, you either need consensus or uh, over a state channel or some other communication to say, yep, you're the one that's gonna actually do this thing. So if you're running, you know, just as a, um, you know, the, the common case right, is like you're gonna run MapReduce, 
or some, some huge data set. Um, then yeah, break it up, push it over these streams, collect the results, do the reduce. Um, and if that gets run multiple times or once, uh, unless you have uh, managed effects, or unless you have like actual effects, off-platform effects, um, then the, du the duplication on the compute is actually fine, because it's deterministic. Um, it's just wasteful. So, but in the same way that you might get duplicate blocks in a, in a network call, right? So, so essentially, I think that needs to be tunable depending on the use case. Uh, there's also the case of like, I want to run this over my cluster of those machines, um, send it to them, right? Um, and this starts to look a whole lot more like this stuff happening in um, the cloud native folks stuff, right? So. So I'm gonna ask the fun question, what's the current usability? As in like, can I just like pull up my IDE and jet like say like, hey, here's my data, here's my program, compile it into a bundle, or do I have like, like how do I do that? This does not exist. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe to clarify the, uh, the, the presentation is, hey, here's something we've been thinking about. This is actually on our roadmap, or at least a significant subset of this is on our roadmap. I would like to collaborate with other people to build this thing and solve it for everybody. Are there other people that are interested in this? It sounds like probably yes. Um, yeah, okay, great. <laughs> so we should probably talk then. Uh, uh, slight adjustment. It does exist. It's in the future. It's our job to figure out how to get into that future so we can have it. I love it, yes. Great, thank you.